it on? Good morning. We are going to get started soon with our prelude. Um, as um, a tradition we've had the last couple of years, while we are enjoying our prelude, please come up and place a flower on the cross as a symbol of the resurrection of Jesus. It's good to see you all this morning. Before we get started, as usual, we do have a few quick announcements that we'd like to get through. Uh, the first is a reminder, or for some of you, maybe uh, news for the first time. We do have a time of fellowship with refreshments following the service. That'll be through that door on your left uh, in what we call Homer Hall. We have a lot of food. There's uh, sweetbreads and cookies and drinks and all sorts of things. So please do stick around at least for a few minutes and enjoy some refreshments after the service. Um, as many of you know, we've been doing a toilet paper drive this month to support the FM, the Faith of Manlius Food Pantry. Uh, they go through about 3,000 rolls of toilet paper a year, uh, giving them out to families who can't necessarily afford uh, to provide that for themselves. And so far, we have gathered or raised money for uh, about 2,000 rolls, nearly 2,000 rolls. 1,800. Well, there's some more rolls that came in this morning, I saw. So we're pushing towards 2,000. We would love, if possible, to cover all of their toilet paper needs for the entire year, uh, which leaves us about 1,000 rolls short right now. So if you're interested in helping out with that, it's 
probably too late for you to bring actual toilet paper this morning unless you're going to sneak out during the service and rush back. Um, <laughs> please don't do that. <laughs> uh, but you, you, can, uh, you can give financially if you want to help that toilet paper drive. There should be envelopes in the in the pockets in the back of the pew in front of you. If you pull out one of those envelopes and just write toilet paper or TP on it and stick cash or a check in there, that will go towards our toilet paper drive and maybe we can actually provide everything the pantry needs for the entire year. This is the last week that we've, we've been doing it for the month of March. Also, uh, Easter lilies are looking beautiful. There is an insert in your bulletin, a purple one, that tells you who the, the lilies have been given in honor or in memory of. And if you purchase Easter lilies, please remember to bring them home with you after service. We don't have a, a gardener on staff who will take care of them during the week. So if you don't take them home, they're probably going to die. Um, so please do take those home if you're interested in having them at all. Uh, what else? A couple of quick calendar issues. Um, a reminder, our, our new book club is starting Wednesday the 3rd. And I believe that's, is that 1230? Where did Karen go? 1130? That's at 11.30 uh, a.m. So if you're interested and available during the day, our new book club is kicking off on the 3rd at 11.30. And also on the 13th, we do have a planning meeting coming up. Those of you who are uh, parts of different committees or teams in the church who are interested in helping us plan for the summer and fall, even if you're not currently part of a team or, or a committee, if you have ideas or are interested in what kind of pro programming we're going to be doing over the summer and in the fall, uh, we'd love to have you join us for that. That's April 13th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Are there any other announcements that need to be made this morning? Right. So we are going to provide child care, but only for part of the service. So if you came expecting there to be child care, don't worry. We have not swindled you. We just like to include the kids for some of the opening songs and things. So uh, after the choir sings for the first time, we'll make an announcement uh, that the kids can leave. And there'll be, you'll see some adults leaving at the same time to supervise those children. We're not just setting them free to roam. Uh, but we'll, we'll let you know when it's time to send the kids out. If your kids want to stay with you, please feel free to keep them in here. I have no objections to kids making noise during church. Uh, it's, I, I love the sound of children in the pews, but if your kids would like to go, I think we have a, a craft and things for them to do. A craft, a story, a song. So if you're interested, your kids can go when we say to send them out, and then they'll come back and we'll make an announcement before the choir sings the second time. Uh, and the choir will come up here as the kids are coming in. And hopefully it'll all be very clear. And if it's not, someone will catch your kids if they run off. <laughs> I, can't, I can't guarantee that. <laughs> all right, are there any other announcements that need to be made this morning? No? It is truly a joy to celebrate the resurrection this morning with all of you. I'll invite you to rise and greet one another. Happy Easter. Happy Easter! Please remain standing if you are able and join me in the call to worship. Alleluia! Christ is risen! Christ is risen indeed! Darkness has been vanquished. The brilliant light of hope has come. Come, let us worship and celebrate the good news. Alleluia! Christ is risen! Our hymn of celebration is Christ the Lord is Risen Today, number 302 in the red hymnals, or on the screens behind me, we're going to sing verses 1, 2, 3, and 5.
Now you may be seated. Now we're done. Now we're done. Well, with that hint. Please join me in our opening prayer. Almighty, ever-loving God, joy floods over our souls on this day. Christ is risen. Here is vanquish. Open our hearts and our spirits to receive fully the joy which has been given for us. Let us celebrate the victory of Christ and hope we have in it for the future. Amen. The choir is now going to sing our anthem of preparation. send your kids out if you'd like and uh, there's adults some of them at least are raising their hands so you can see who to send them with So we've come to that time in our service for prayers of the people. 
you could raise your hand and there, there'd be a mic coming around and you could share briefly the concern or joy you have. We ask that you use people's only their first names because we're streaming this live. Um, and after each one, I'll lead us in a response. Lord, have mercy. Hear our prayers. And hold the mic like this so we can hear you. Prayers for my friend Brenda, who came back from Florida on Thursday and suffered a heart attack. Lord, have mercy. Hear our prayers. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Lord, have mercy. Hear our prayers. For those who are going to have upcoming surgeries. Lord, have mercy. Hear our prayers. Pray for George, who has fallen and broken his hip. Lord, have mercy. Hear our prayers. Prayers for my sister that had a stroke. Lord, have mercy. Hear our prayers. I have three of them. Uh, my son-in-law, Joe, s uh, slipped on black ice and broke his right leg and his right wrist. And... Yesterday, one of my great-grandchildren, Little Maple, fell out of a tree and broke her wrist. And I'd like prayers for my husband, Bob, who is still, re he's recovering very nicely from a very bad fall. Lord, have mercy, hear our prayers. Prayers for my friend Karen. She was just placed on hospice. She's actually not really a friend. She's more like was my mom back in middle and high school. So if you could please pray for Karen and her family. Lord, have mercy. Hear our prayers. I wish to thank uh, all of you for the prayers and also for the card that you sent for our recovery. And also uh, for Barb and Fred, who stood in for us yesterday, God bless them. Lord, have mercy. Hear our prayers. Uh, prayers for my brother, Thomas, who was hospitalized for panic attacks and anxiety. Lord, have mercy. Hear our prayers. Joyous prayers for my mother, who turns 103 this week. Lord, have mercy. Hear our prayers. Prayers for Shirley, an old-time active member of this church. Lord, have mercy. Hear our prayers. Thank you for all of your prayers and cards. Um, I have recovered completely, and I really appreciate all of you. Thank you. Lord, have mercy. Hear our prayers. And for birthdays this week. Lord, have mercy. Hear our prayers. I have a joy. Uh, Bill and I have a granddaughter who we had not seen for about five years due to COVID. She married about three years ago, and her, she and her husband, who we had not met before, came up and spent several days with us this week, and it was wonderful. Lord, have mercy. Hear our prayers. Um, prayers for our daughter, Amber, and Harper, who aren't feeling good. Lord, have mercy. Hear our prayers. I'll invite you all to take a moment to pray silently on your own, and then I'll lead us in prayer together.
living and loving God. There is none like you with the power to create the heavens and the earth, with the power to overcome death. And we praise you. We praise you for your glory. We praise you for your strength. We praise you for your patience with us, for the grace that you extend to us, for the love that you continually pour out for us. We confess, Lord, that far too often we go through our day without even noticing those things. Forgive us. Forgive us and help us to have our eyes open to all the ways that you're at work in our lives and in the lives of the people around us. Help us to be aware of your loving presence day by day. Help us to be grateful for the grace you give us and to take advantage of it that we might grow in our love, in our patience, in the grace that we extend to others. God, it is truly remarkable that you loved us enough to come and live among us, that you loved us so much that you would suffer and die for our benefit. And it's truly remarkable how you conquered the grave in order to guarantee for us new life. Thank you. Help us to live in that new life, to live as new people, set free from our selfishness, set free to live in love like you do. Help us to demonstrate that in our lives, God. Help us to glorify you and to draw others towards you. And God, we thank you for all those blessings that you have helped us to recognize all those moments where we were able to see your work. We thank you for the healing that we've received, for the recovery from illnesses and injuries. We thank you for birthdays and celebrations. Especially today, we thank you for the celebration of Easter, for the time that we get with our families, with our family here in this place for the joy that we experience each year as we remember your triumph. We thank you, God, for the way that you lead us, for the way that you protect and provide for us. We thank you for all the things that you have done and are doing and will do in our lives. And we thank you, Lord, for the gift of prayer, for this opportunity to come before you and give voice to those things that weigh on our hearts. We join together in lifting up all of those concerns that were shared. That's so many more that we know went unshared. We ask God that you continue to be at work in each of them. We lift up those who are sick, those who are in recovery, those who are headed into surgery soon. We ask that your Holy Spirit would move in them, that you would bring healing and wholeness that you would restore their bodies and make them strong. We lift up those who are mourning God, those who are celebrating this Easter without a loved one for the first time, those who are mourning, celebrating what is probably the last Easter with a loved one. We lift up those who are mourning after many Easter's alone, God, bring them comfort, bring healing to their hearts. Help them to be especially aware of your presence on this day. We lift up all those who are in need of your protection from hunger, from violence, from all the things that are going on in the world today. We ask that you would protect them and keep them safe. And God, we ask that you'd be at work in our broken country, in our broken world. That you would bring healing of relationships. That you would bring healing of the systems that are in place that deny justice to people. That you would bring healing to the hearts 
that yearn for selfish gain, that are willing to wrong people for it. Continue to be at work in this world, Lord, in and through us. We offer our lives, Lord. Show us how we can be a part of the things that you're doing, how we can bring healing and relief to others, how we can help with your provision and your protection for others. Show us, Lord, how we can share your love with others. We thank you, God, and we praise you. And we ask all of these things in the holy and precious and powerful name of our risen Savior, our living Lord, your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us how to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to sing another hymn now. Uh, it's the day of resurrection. You can find it on page 303 of the red hymnal or on the screens behind me. And I'll invite you, if you're able, to please stand while we sing. seated. Since Christmas, our scripture readings and sermons have been following the life of Jesus. We've heard about his miraculous birth and some of the early affirmations of who he was, about how he called his disciples, taught them, and sent them out to enlarge his ministry, and about some of the miracles he did and the claims he made about himself. In just the past week, we've been reminded of how crowds of people in Jerusalem welcomed him as the promised Messiah, how he shared a final meal with his disciples before he was arrested by those who feared his power and popularity, and how he was executed on a Roman cross. Even though Jesus had tried to warn his disciples that the cross was coming, his death left them heartbroken and confused. It wasn't with joy, but with deep sorrow that some of his followers set out for his tomb the morning after the Sabbath. Listen once again to what they found there. This is the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, 
Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to the hands of sinners and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw that the linen clothes by themselves. Then he went home amazed at what had happened. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. What's the big deal about Easter? That's not really the right question. But there's lots of answers to what's the big deal about Easter, right? We get extra music at church. There's extra refreshments afterwards. We get to see some folks that we don't see as often. We get to spend time with our families. Uh, for those of us who are a little bit older, we used to get a week off of school when Easter came around. All of those are things that make Easter a big deal. The real question I want to ask this morning is, what's the big deal with the resurrection? It's celebrated as the most important day on the Christian calendar. Why? Why is it such a big deal? I want to propose three things for us to consider. Three different ways in which the resurrection is a big deal. The first is what it meant for Jesus' disciples, Jesus' closest friends. These were people who had given up their livelihood. They had left behind their careers, their homes, their own lives to follow Jesus. Some of them for as much as three years. Can you imagine spending three years just hanging out with the same group of people like every single day? For some of you, that might sound fantastic. For some of you, you might think, oh gosh, I can't imagine anybody I want to spend that much time with. Every indication we have is that they enjoyed that time together. They spent three years with Jesus. They heard him teach every day. They saw him work miracles over and over and over again. They believed so strongly in who he was and in what he was doing that they took that mission on themselves, even going out and sharing his teaching themselves. They rode with him or walked with him as he rode into the city of Jerusalem. As the crowds cheered and laid palm branches and cloaks across the road. And that must have seemed like the fulfillment, the fullness of what they had been hoping and expecting. Everybody was recognizing how great Jesus was. And something amazing was about to happen. Something amazing was about to happen, but it certainly wasn't what they were expecting. Jesus didn't become the king of Israel, at least not in the sense that anybody pictured it. He was arrested, beaten, publicly humiliated, and executed. And for his closest friends, that was devastating. Not only because their closest friend had just died, but because this person that they believed in so much that they left behind their homes and their work, and in some cases even family. This person that they believed in so strongly was taken away from them in what at the time seemed like a tragic end. Perhaps even a, a disputing of everything they had believed. And so when we arrive at the beginning of chapter 4, on the first day of the week, so Jesus had died the day before the Sabbath. They didn't have time to do all the funeral rituals that they were supposed to do. They didn't have time to fully prepare his body. And so they had to wait until the Sabbath was over. And after the Sabbath, on the first day of the Jewish week, they went to the tomb where Jesus had been laid. Not full of hope. 
not because they had some sense that there was going to be a happy ending to the story. They went to the tomb taking the spices that they had prepared. Those were funeral preparations. They brought spices to anoint his body with so that they could finish the funeral preparations so that his body could be laid to rest. They went there fully expecting to say goodbye for one final time to their dear friend, their teacher. And when they arrived, they found the tomb empty. They did not find the body. And again, their first impulse wasn't to rejoice. They had gone for their final goodbye. They had gone to pay their last respects by performing these funeral rituals. And now the body was gone and they couldn't even do that. Luke says, well, they were perplexed about this, or at least that's how it's translated. That seems like a generous term to use, perplexed. They were confused. They were stunned. They were lost. They were broken. They stood there unsure what to do because even that last goodbye had been stolen from them. And suddenly, two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them the supernatural occurrence, this intrusion of the supernatural into the regular world. They were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. They recognized there was something special about those men. And the men speak and say, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee, the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. And then they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to the rest. Everyone, all of Jesus' followers, had been told that he was going to be crucified. Jesus had told them that. And they were so devastated when it happened that they didn't even remember. And they certainly didn't remember that Jesus promised to come back. In fact, when they tell his 11 disciples, because uh, Judas wasn't with him anymore, when they tell the 11 disciples, they didn't believe the women. Not just because they were women, right? There's a little bit of sexism here, but it's also because they didn't, it wasn't something they could grasp. Peter has to run and check, and he finds the tomb empty as well. And he's amazed. Peter has been reminded of Jesus' promise, and for the first time he sees the empty tomb not with extra sorrow, but with hope. They have to wait for confirmation. But the resurrection becomes the, the resurrection becomes central to their identity as followers of Christ. Suddenly they go from the devastation of the loss of their friend to being reunited with this person that they care so deeply about. And they go from the sense of defeat that what they had believed so strongly and that they were willing to leave so much behind had been ripped away from them, had been somehow proven less than true, to suddenly knowing, having this incredible evidence that their hope was well-founded, their belief in Jesus was well-placed. For the disciples, the resurrection was an enormous moment of triumph, of reunion, of hope in the future and joy in the present. That's one of the reasons why we still celebrate it to this day. And it should be for us a hope of, a, a, a moment of hope and of joy, a reminder that Christ has conquered death and that his promises are trustworthy. That's our first reason why the resurrection is such a big deal. The second, first was what it says about the, for the disciples. The second is what it says for Jesus, about Jesus. For those of you who have been here for parts or for all of our sermon series from Christmas until now following Jesus' life, one of the things that we've talked about a few times is the claims that Jesus makes about himself. He's teaching, he's preaching, he's performing these miracles. 
And oftentimes we have this desire to reduce Jesus, to make him just a teacher, just a, a moral philosopher, just an example of how we should treat one another. But Jesus repeatedly challenges those attempts at reduction. Jesus says things that place him on equal footing with God, says things about being one with God. And sometimes we read back on that with a little skepticism, but we can see in the way that the Jewish leaders at the time react that it was very clear to them what he was saying. They often, they usually respond as if it's blasphemy. You can't say that about yourself. Now we've talked about how it challenges us in our understanding of Jesus. Jesus claims to be divine. Jesus claims to be one with God. And because he claims that, we can't just see him as a teacher. We can't just see him as a moral philosopher or just see him as an example. Because if you say things like that, you're either unreliable or you're so much more than any of those things. And in the resurrection, Jesus puts an exclamation point on his claims of divinity. When Jesus says, I am God, he backs it up. Not only by walking on water, not only by feeding crowds, not only by letting the lame walk and giving sight to the blind. Jesus backs up his claim by walking out of the tomb. He was executed in public, in plain view of crowds of people and of Roman soldiers who had crucified people before. These aren't rookies out there. They know what a dead guy looks like. Jesus conquered death and walked out of the tomb. And because of that, we have very little leeway. I mean, you can deny it if you want. That's up to you. But if you take seriously the events of Jesus' life, it leaves us with very little wiggle room when it comes to taking seriously his claims about who he is. And that has implications for us in terms of how we respond to his authority, in terms of how significant his teachings should be in our lives. Which brings us to the third thing. Easter is hugely important because of the impact it had on the disciples. It's hugely important because of what it says about Jesus. And it's hugely important because of what it continues to say to and about us today. Right? Because if we are confronted with the reality that Jesus is so much more than just a good teacher, so much more than just a philosopher, it asks more of us, it demands more of us. If Jesus is the living God as he claimed to be, his promises have so much power. There's so much hope available for us. In a time and place where hope is a rarer commodity than it should be, hope is available to us in and through Jesus Christ. The promises that he made, the promises that he's already fulfilled, the promises that wait for us. And I would say to you that if you're in a place like so many of us today where you could use some hope, grab a Bible and crack it open. I say crack because I still like to use paper Bibles you all can look at the Bible in four and a half seconds by whipping out your phone and typing Bible into Google. We have unlimited access to the Bible and it is full of promises, full of hope. Hope is available to us when the world around us looks so bleak. And that's only part of what makes it so significant for us. Because Jesus, in conquering death, demonstrates for us the hope and the promise of eternal life. We need not fear death because Jesus has already conquered it. This is a, a two-part thing, right? Jesus conquers sin on the cross. And I don't have enough time to completely unpack that. The cross is the fulfillment of a, a pattern that had been set in place throughout the entire Old Testament a sacrificial system where people's sins were overlooked by God or forgiven 
People were counted as innocent even though we aren't because of a system of sacrifices. And Jesus fulfills that. Jesus willingly gives his blood on the cross in order to pay our debt, the consequence, the wages of our sin. And so on the cross, Jesus conquers sin and sets us free. At the empty tomb, he conquers death. And so now we've been freed from both sin and death. And so we no longer need to live in fear of death because we have the promise of eternal life. And we no longer need to fear the promise of eternal life because having been set free from sin, we are free to rejoice, to look forward to an eternal reward, to eternal salvation, to eternity in a new creation where there is no pain or sorrow or sickness or death. Jesus conquers both sin and death that we might have hope, that we might live as eternal people, as resurrection people. There's one other thing that I want to draw our attention to when we talk about why the resurrection is so significant for us. There's a line in here that would be easy for us to gloss over These angels, they say to the women, why do you look for the living among the dead? And those of you who have heard me preach before, you know that I can't let a Sunday go by without at least a little bit of a challenge, right? And this is the part that I want to challenge you with. These words of the angels, why do you look for the living among the dead? It was meant for them that they might know they're looking in the wrong place. That they should be looking outside of this tomb. They should be looking among the living for Jesus who is risen. And it means something very similar for us as well, or at least it can. Because so often, when it comes to our faith, we look to the past to see Jesus. We look at people who impacted our lives growing up, Maybe you look back to how the church was 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. I happen to know that somebody recently celebrated their 70th year as a member of this church. And I'm going to convince her to let us celebrate that uh, at some point in the coming months. 70 years as a member of this specific church. Maybe for you, you look back at a, a, a day when the church was exactly the way you wanted it. And that's the, the, the crux of your faith. And when you look for encouragement, you look back to that. Maybe you look back to a parent or a grandparent or a Sunday school teacher who had a big impact, and you look for Jesus there. Maybe you look back to to history or even to scripture. Those are all good places to look. Those are all sources of encouragement that is great for us to benefit from. But Jesus Christ is risen, and that hasn't changed. And when we look for Jesus, we shouldn't be looking among the dead. We should be looking among the living. Jesus is still alive and active today. Are you looking for him? Are you watching for the ways that Jesus is at work in your life and in the lives of the people around you? Are you looking for those places where Jesus is at work and how you can participate in the work that he's doing? Are you looking for those miracles, big and small, that Jesus is still doing in the world today? That's our challenge this Sunday. As we celebrate the risen Lord, as we celebrate the living Lord, I want to challenge you. Open your eyes. Look around today. Look around in the coming week, the coming month. See if you can't see Jesus alive and active in your life today. Don't look for the living among the dead, but look outward and see what God is doing because that is at least part of the power of the resurrection. Amen. Amen. The choir is going to come up and sing for us again. And if you'd like to worship through your giving, we don't pass the plates around anymore. We stopped doing that during COVID, but we do have plates available in the front and in the back. And if you'd like to worship through your giving, you can use those plates while they're singing. Those of you who are joining us online, as always, if you'd like to worship through your giving, you can use the donate button on our website or you can mail checks into the church.
Please join me in our offertory prayer. God of the victory of life over death, on this glorious Easter day, we rejoice in the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. Just as the women encountered the empty tomb and the angelic message of new life, 
we too encounter the living Christ in our hearts and lives. Bless our giving and help us discover the transformative power of the risen Jesus in our lives. In the holy name of our living Lord, we pray. Amen. Our hymn of sending this morning is Easter People, Raise Your Voices. You can find it on page 304 of the hymnal or on the screens. Go forth in joy. Let your voices ring with victory. For Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Amen. Have a good week and please do stick around for some refreshments.